Hello, welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today, we're going to jump back into existentialism. And we're going to be talking about Soren Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. Fear and Trembling is a book about faith. And it's specifically a book about the human experience regarding faith. Now, that's, a, that's different from what the meaning of faith is. It's two different things, and this is very important to understand when we talk about fear and trembling. What does it mean to be faithful versus what faith actually means? Okay, two different things, and let's take that into consideration. The thing is, uh, Soren Kierkegaard argues that uh, faith is just something that's beyond understanding. I mean, it, it, when you talk about true faith, what you're really talking about is um, the spiritual. And the spiritual is something that's kind of beyond uh, human comprehension in terms of the mind. And that's when you talk, start talking about faith, that's, you're getting into that. But we can't, we, what we can do is we can talk, you know, we can uh, conceptualize in the mind what it means to be faithful, like how the, the struggle and the experience and the hardship and the revelations and ultimately the goodness of being faithful. And that's what fear and trembling is about. Now fear and trembling uses uh, many stories uh, from Greek myths to um, others tales, but it primarily uses the story of Abraham, um, a significant figure from the Bible. And Abraham is a, is a common figure. I mean, you might know about him. A lot of people do, especially if you're raised as a Christian or um, you're raised in Ju Judaism. You know a lot about Abraham. He's a pretty prominent figure. But if you don't, uh, you know, I'm just let you know that he is a very significant figure in the Bible. One of the big stories about him in the Bible has to do with God commanding him to sacrifice his son Isaac um, as an offering to, to him, to God. That's a very significant story in the Bible. A lot of uh, pastors and uh, preachers and religious leaders use it as a way to teach faith. This is the primary story Kierkegaard uses to talk about what it means to be faithful. Check out this quote. There were countless generations that knew the story of Abraham by heart, word for word. How many did it make sleepless? If the rich young man whom Christ met on the road had sold all his possessions and given them to the poor, we would praise him as we, we praise all great deeds. But we would not understand even him without some labor. Yet he would not have become an Abraham, even had he given away the best he had. What is left out of the Abraham story is the anguish. For while I am under no obligation to money to a son, the father has the highest and most sacred of obligations. Yet anguish is a dangerous affair for the squeamish. So people forget it. Notwithstanding, they want to talk about Abraham. So they talk and in the course of conversation, they interchange the words Isaac and best. Everything goes excellently. So what Kierkegaard is saying here is that uh, the significance of this act, Abraham willing to sacrifice his son as an offering to God, what, what the, um, the significance of that is that of the anguish of doing so. And Kierkegaard focuses on that, the struggle. Let's say you're really, you know, he uses that example of the rich man. The rich man gives a lot of his money. Uh, to help people or maybe he's given his money to serve God and that's cool um, And you know money a lot of people like money and a lot of people uh, are really hurt to see it go But it's not the same thing as like sacrificing your son or something like that. I mean, that's a whole nother level and um, Kierkegaard talks about how like okay Abraham is in this higher echelon because he's he's really given up something that's incredibly important to him Listen to this next quote. It breaks down what uh, Kierkegaard is trying to do here. What I intend now is to extract from the story of Abraham its dialectical element in the form of the problemata in order to see how monstrous a paradox faith is, a paradox capable of making a murder into a holy act well-pleasing to God, a paradox which gives Isaac back to Abraham, 
which no thought can grasp because faith begins precisely where thinking leaves off. So what Kierkegaard wants to do here is he wants to explain that faith is a paradox or you know what I'm what I'm saying is he's trying Kierkegaard is trying to say that faith is beyond comprehension is beyond understanding. Uh, Kierkegaard so, goes so far as to say God is commanding Abraham to murder his son for God. So okay you have a sin that's uh, God's asking Abraham to do but ultimately that's what God commands therefore it's good because it's God's will so it's a paradox right check out this quote as everyone knows Luke chapter 14 verse 26 presents a remarkable teaching on the absolute duty to God if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters yeah in his own life also he cannot be my d disciple. This is a hard saying. Who can bear to hear it? And for that reason, it is heard very seldom. Yet this silence is only a futile evasion. The student of theology learns, however, that these words occur in the New Testament, and in one or another exegetic aid he finds the information that to hate both here and in some other passages is used by adopting a weaker sense to mean love less, give less priority to, show no respect to, make nothing of. I'm skipping a little bit further down. One now sees readily that if the passage is to have any sense, it must be understood literally. It is God who demands absolute love. Again, I'm further skipping down. But how then hate them? I should not keep up the human love-hate distinction here, not because I have so much against it, since at least it is a passionate distinction, but it is egoistic and so does not fit here. If I regard the requirement as a paradox, on the other hand, then I understand it, i.e. understand it in the way one can understand a paradox. The absolute duty can then lead to what ethics would forbid but it can by no means make the night of faith have done with loving. This is shown by Abraham. The moment he is ready to sacrifice Isaac, the ethical expression for what he does is this, he hates Isaac. But if he actually hates Isaac, he can be certain that God does not require this of him. For Cain and Abraham are not the same. Isaac he must love with all his soul. When God asks for Isaac, Abraham must, if possible, love him even more, and only then can he sacrifice him. For it is indeed this love of Isaac that, in its paradoxical opposition to his love of God, makes his act a sacrifice. But the distress and anguish in the paradox is that, humanly speaking, he is quite incapable of, incapable of making himself understood. Only in the moment when his act is an absolute contradiction with his feeling, only then does he sacrifice Isaac. But the reality of his act is that in virtue of which he belongs to the universal, and there he is and remains a murderer. So let's talk about this for a, a minute. Uh, let's try and analyze this quote for a second. So I think this kind of breaks down a lot what it means to be faithful. So what Kierkegaard is saying is that what Abraham did, which is very significant, is that he was able to hate what he loves the most for God and that that is the contradiction right the fact that you know he loved the what he loves most of all on earth like his son Isaac had to murder him so he had to in some way hate uh, him now the meaning of hate as King of is saying is it's not this humanly hate that we know of, you know, when you look at hate up in Webster's Dictionary. That's not the hate that we're talking about here. We're talking about a spiritual kind of hate, a hate where it's like you're putting this thing that you love below um, God. You're making God the highest point, you know, or, you know, to say it in another way, uh, the spirit is what's coming first, the spiritual, like God is the spiritual. You're putting that above everything else. And I think the significance here is what Kierkegaard is trying to do is he's showing you that faith is um, is a contradiction and it's, it's a paradox and it's something that's beyond human comprehension which is what we were saying we've been saying and it's in that way that we become faithful 
oftentimes uh, people will disregard spirituality or religion and things like that because they'll say that it's beyond human comprehension. It's not logical, it's not reasonable, therefore I don't accept it. And uh, you know, them saying that, them saying that uh, the spiritual, the religious is beyond human comprehension. Uh, it, you can't explain it, it's illogical, it's not, um, it's unreasonable. Uh, that is true to a, a large extent, like in terms of human logic and human reason and human understanding, yeah, it is completely um, illogical and is contradictory and it, it, does, it does present a paradox. If you, if you use, if you try to put it in terms of human understanding, you can't do it. It's, it's just not possible. And really that's what it means to be faith, to have faith is to go into the realm of contradictory and uh, to be in this in this paradox that is faith and that's really that's what it means to be faithful and to further push this idea forward to be faithful we you do have to go through this mode of fear and trembling this anguish even you have to struggle with that you have to be like okay i i have faith in God or the spiritual or whatever religion you were talking about here or spirituality that we're talking about here uh, that has to happen and to do that you have to deny um, logic in some ways you have to face some sort of contradiction and that's very hard to do right uh, in fact that can bring about some anguish but ultimately that's a good kind of anguish like I say, that's a necessary anguish that's an anguish that needs to happen. It's kind of like the, the material self battling with the spiritual self, right? Or reconciling with each other. When you become faithful in the spiritual sense, you have to come to terms with the fact that it, that state of being is a contradictory state of being in this material world. Because you, would, you do have to start to do things like hate things that you really love or put certain things or certain aspects of your life above other things that you wouldn't naturally suspect you should put above these things. That kind of results in this anguish, this fear and this trembling, right, as the book is uh, titled. It's a good title for this book, actually. Let me leave you with this final quote. Faith is the highest passion in a human being. Many in every generation may not come that far, but none comes further. Whether there are also many who do not discover it in our own age, I leave open. I can only refer to my own experience, that of one who makes no secret of the fact that he has far to go, yet without therefore wishing to deceive either himself or what is great by reducing this latter to a triviality, to a children's disease which one must hope to get over as soon as possible. But life has tasks enough, even for one who fails to come as far as faith. And when he loves these, honestly, life won't be a waste either, even if it can never compare with that of those who had a sense of the highest and grasped it. Kierkegaard talks about how faith is the highest state of a human being, right, of human existence. And he's, you know, he's not talking about whether who's faithful and who's not faithful. And, uh, you know, the other thing that is very interesting is that he doesn't really even explain why faith is the highest a state of being like he doesn't even go there one reason is that I think if he were to do that he would kind of contradict his own self because he's saying that faith is a paradox and it's contradictory and it's beyond human understanding so he wouldn't be able to explain it and he state he states that he kind of leaves that to the people who study theology you know or re religious figures and such it was funny when I was reading the book I was waiting for that moment for him to explain like okay you're saying you know faith is this contradictory thing and it's uh, the highest form of the state of human existence but what you know can, can you get into the part where you start talking about why <laughs> why what what is faith like what is the meaning of faith you know once we are faithful how does that make our lives better you know I was waiting for that but he doesn't really go there and I, I, initially I was disappointed actually <laughs> Yeah, but toward the end of the book, uh, as he concluded, uh, it kind of, what he did pretty much blew my mind in an, in an unexpected way. And uh, Soren Kierkegaard, he'll do that. He'll, uh, 
pill, you'll read is re you'll start reading a book expecting something to happen. You're expecting some revelation to occur, and it never happens. But what happens instead is he'll he'll blow your mind in a way you didn't expect. Rather than get abstract and talk about faith, try to explain it in human terms, uh, which cannot really be done. Rather than him trying to break down faith simply on a logical standpoint or even a philosophical standpoint what he does instead is that he breaks down the human experience again we're talking about existentialism i mean he really he is he makes his title worthy he really is the father of existentialism in, in my mind because he focuses on the human experience relating to faith what does it mean to be a human and be faithful you know how does that affect you in a human sense and that's a very important to talk about that and uh, Kierkegaard goes into great detail about that and he talks about how Abraham felt as he traveled to the mountain where he was gonna sacrifice his son Isaac and the struggles he went through the anguish and uh, you know he talked about the human experience of Abraham he broke down Abraham as a as a human being and he talked about like what well, you know as as he was explaining it I couldn't help but like think put myself in Abraham's shoes and like man if God asked me to sacrifice somebody so important to me how would I feel like how how difficult would that be and the more you do that the more respect you start to have for Abraham the more admiration you have for Abraham and the more admiration you have for the lesson of that story and what that lesson was trying to demonstrate is it was a lot of it was the human experience of being of being faithful and it's breaking down what it means to be faithful and that's very important because sometimes we think of uh, the spiritual life you know if, we, if you want to just talk about the Christian life of being faithful in the Christian sense um, it can be a struggle there's a lot of anguish involved but ultimately it's good spirituality you do have to come to this point of anguish of this fear and trembling to you have to come to this realization that to make sense out of life to really start to begin to understand the meaning of life you're going to have to accept that there are just some contradictory aspects that go beyond human country comprehension and you kind of have to just deal with that and kind of accept those things for as they are as they are contradictions and paradoxes but you know ultimately they aren't truly contradictions and uh, paradoxes really what it is is that they're just beyond our understand our human mind like we can't uh, process them in, in our mind you know it's beyond human comprehension so what to us seems to be a contradiction is not truly a contradiction in in the ultimate sense in the spiritual sense and you know we're putting spirituality at least in my mind I believe spirituality is the highest form of existence you might disagree with that uh, Kierkegaard he's definitely is with on that level of, um, of thought but it blew my mind in that way, the fact that, oh, okay, I see what Kierkegaard wasn't trying to do. He wasn't trying to explain, put faith in some uh, philosophical box. What he was trying to do is uh, focus on the human experience with faith, what it means to be faithful as a human being. And he's trying to explain the existentialism of faith. <laughs> so and I think that's very significant and important because it starts... Again, we're just focusing on reality and what's real and what's true. And, you know, not everything is sugar and rainbows, right? But I think ultimately, once we uh, get to the end and we understand or we come to terms with the true meaning of things, then I think that's what the most important part. I, I feel that way. And I think Kierkegaard would agree. <laughs> and I'm on, I'm on the exact same page as Kierkegaard. That was, this was a really good book. If you're trying to, if you're getting into existentialism, um, this is a great book to start. It's not even that long. It's kind of short. It's like 150 pages, I think. Um, it's even shorter. Uh, it's 150 pages with the introduction. I think it's about 100 pages without the introduction. The book is really good at like breaking down what existentialism is because I mean, does the guy that uh, kind of started the movement, Kierkegaard himself. Uh, but it, it, it does a good job trying breaking down what the focus of existentialism is. And, you know, it's about the human experience and um, and the meaning behind the human experience. And it focuses on, it puts that on the forefront. Anyway, I would recommend it. 
check it out. Sarin Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling. You got one of those old school paintings right here. It's, you know, Aram at the moment, he's about to sacrifice Isaac and then the angel comes down and just stops him. And at that moment, you know, he reaches the epitome, the, high, um, the highest passion, according to Kierkegaard, of human experience. Thank you for watching. This is the Black Ponderer. Tune in next time for more philosophical thought. And that's a primary, man, there's like planes all over the place. Well, we are next to the airport. <laughs> I guess I just have to deal with that. And the more you do that, the more you, <laughs> damn.